Hi, this is Craig Tomlaw from Startup Stories, and uh, I'm with uh, Kevin Cox, founder of Welcomer, uh, to find out about his story and uh, how he got into startups. Yes, so um, I retired. Mm -hmm. Is how I got into startups. Well, no, that's not quite right. I, I've been in a few others before that, but I didn't actually know that they were startups. Um, um, but the the latest journey, which has been over now going for 20 years, um, happened when I retired from um, being an academic. And um, I'd always, when you're an academic, and then you, then you you have ideas, but you can never get anything done. <laughs> right? You can write about things, but you never actually produce anything. Um, well, you do produce something, you produce papers and you do little experiments and things, but you never actually build anything. And um, so I got into the startup business because I wanted to do it. Okay. Because I had ideas and I wanted to see them come to fruition. So we were. Um, so I was talking about retiring mm -hmm. and being an academic, um, but I was thinking about it before I came along as to why I wanted to do this. Um, and I guess it's because I was an accidental academic. Um, mm -hmm. I, I come from I, I come from the generation where we were the first ones in our generation or in in our family to ever go to university. Right? Yes, we were the first one to to do something and so forth. And and I come from a generation when my father was in the Second World War and he didn't have a very good education and he was determined that his children would. And so it was always expected that we would bec become educated, as it were, as opposed to becoming what everyone else in the family did and largely still do. They're all small entrepreneurs, um, small business people, um, builders, or just all, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, but when you become when you when you get an education, um, you, you actually used to be you didn't you you didn't work for yourself any longer. There weren't the jobs like your job now mm. that existed in those days. Um, you became part of an organisation, and um, um, so it was always in my background and always along the road while I was with organisations. Um, uh, it was always part of the, the ethos, if you like. I was, I was always thinking about, not it's not, not thinking about being your own boss or anything of that nature. That's not what the objective is. The objective is to be able to, to build something and to achieve something that you want to do. That's, that's really what it's all about because it's a lot more fun. Right? Yes, it is. <laughs> I agree with that. It's, it's fun and, and, and you, don't want to, you don't want to spend your life not doing fun things. And, um, and I, success for, one of the other reasons for staying in academia for quite a long time was that I was still able to do fun things mm -hmm. because things become less fun when you, when you become an administrator and you, bec you attempt to control others rather than a t rather than are able to do things yourself yeah so um so yeah so that's that's how it happened it's almost inevitable yeah so so you did have some room to do experimentation and things like that and yeah. work with yeah. interesting people yes. while you were there oh, but, yes, yes. but i suppose because of your family background you always had that you yes. know lots of people who yes. went into business for themselves yes yes and we started up a couple of little businesses in the times when it wasn't was was an academic at mm -hmm. the times, but I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, uh, at the times at which, um, uh, while we were there, and and we took a couple of ideas and commercialised them. Mm -hmm. um, a couple we didn't commercialise, which we really should have, but um, which, we, which we didn't. But it, it was also different too in those days. There was there was certainly not the emphasis on on the links between industry and university that there are these days so mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite it was quite different and, and also i guess um you know you're talking uh, i i guess quite a bit about the the pre widespread use of computers and pre-internet and well no see, uh, yeah. my, my career has been entirely in computers i'm, I'm yep. one of the people who who really have grown up with computers my the first computer i worked on was a descendant of the ignis 
mm. in the murid machine, and so that's that's quite odd. <laughs> but that's still very specialised. So there, there were lot, there were far fewer people working in them, and there weren't the general applications or the ability no, 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 it to go out and create those businesses. No, no, it wasn't it wasn't like that at all. No. You, you you definitely had to be an an industry. There weren't there wasn't the opportunity of being able to, although. The, the first one we did was, uh, our opportunities came when when um, uh, when the PCs came on the market. Yes. And that's when we really got going. And that was in the 19, late, late 70s, mm. um, was when we were able to actually do things. And you're right, until that time, we weren't actually able to do very much. We did courses. Yes. So I had, I had a little swag of courses that I used to do for the public service. Um, you know, teaching people how to do word processing and things of yes. that nature. Um, yeah, but there was no <coughs> scale. You couldn't really scale those things. No, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was different too. It wasn't building something new, although I suppose building a course is new, but it wasn't quite the same. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so tell me how you ended up in, in Welcome Up, or creating Welcome Up. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, yeah, I was thinking about that too. And, and again, it's, it's one of those things that's almost inevitable on thinking back on it. Um, uh, Welcome Up, is attempting to achieve a solution to the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. okay, that's that's what it really is about. I can't say that, <laughs> but that's fundamentally that's what it's all about. And um, I was very very lucky in my first my first few jobs because I I my first job was as an engineer, and in the winter time I would go back into I was in, in Tasmania, and in the winter time, I'd go back into the office, and and I I did modelling of the electricity system on the on computers, uh, mm -hmm. and so we used um, they were very advanced in those days in terms of their use of technology. So we used all the biggest and best computers um, around the place, which uh, yeah, uh, um, and but the modelling technique. Was that you you built you built the system in the computer? Yes. So what we did was we built the system in the computer, and then we then we ran when you're doing hydroelectric systems. What you do is you get rainfall, and you get river runoff, and you have power stations, you have dams, and you generate power. And so it's a very hard problem to solve mm -hmm. how much power you're going to get out of it, and what sort of dams you should build, and so forth. And the only way of doing it really still is to model it. Mm. So you build a model for how the how the system would work. And so we built models and we then would run water through the model as it were. Now that was fantastic because it got me in the right mindset because we weren't attempting to control things, we were attempting to model what the world was like. Yep. And that then then my next job was with Control Data Corporation, and there I, I again was lucky because I, I worked on the very large computers, and I I got involved in some of the simulations um, uh, around um, uh, atomic bomb explosions and things of that nature. But again, the same sort of stuff, and the languages and the ideas associated with that were all the same. So it's essentially the problem of how do you get a large number of dis disparate resources to work together to, to solve a problem. <coughs> um, and then later on, uh, when I became an academic, I had to suddenly, an accidental academic, I had to suddenly think about how I was going to teach systems analysis it was. And then it became apparent that really the problem was the problem of how people interacted with the computers, because this is right. right that's that that's the whole problem how do you actually get people to interact with computers <coughs> and you don't get people to interact com with computers by telling them what to do mm. you you have to give people a tool that they can use uh, and so when you see a program like busycalc which was the first spreadsheet and you see it you realize immediately that's what you've got to do Right, you've got to be able to have something, a tool that people can use and manipulate and, and, and work on themselves. So it's it's an extension, it's an extension of the mind, rather than 
rather than something that tells you what to do. If yeah. if you can be told what to do, well, the machine may as well do it. Yeah. So so really, it's a, it's an environment where people can play and experiment and yeah. test things and you know even potentially break the system. Yeah. 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 So so in teaching systems analysis, we myself and David Walker wrote probably the first textbook on user interface design, which was, and, and David was a bit of an artist, and so his, his user interface design in the book has all these little drawings in them. Mm -hmm. right? And they're drawings, and the idea was to try and, and tell designers that what they had to do was to think like a user, and to think of what is the problem the user wanted to solve, and so forth. So, so uh, again, another lucky thing that happened was that I, I had to um, I had to do some research, and so I, I got into the into the research. You know, you had to do some research, and, and it yes. turns out that user interface design wasn't real research. Right? Really? Okay. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't counted. Okay. Uh, neither was trying to teach people computing counted. Right, right. So there were various journal articles and things that you had to do. So I had to do something that was more respectable. Mm -hmm. And what was more respectable was solving hard problems, computationally hard problems. So um, we, in talking about our little entrepreneurial efforts, one of the, we were very lucky that we got some little contracts to help solve different hard problems. And one of the problems was manufacturing glass, scheduling the glass manufacturing and scheduling delivery of loads. So we were able to get into that. And the solution there again was to give a tool to people that they could experiment with different ways of doing their glass manufacture and different ways of doing scheduling the things. But they made that they made the most decisions and so forth. So they're modeling again. They're modeling again. Yeah. That then led on to um, an interest in actually how you could try and get modelling done, solving some of the problems that were more, that were like the timetable problem, which are more fixed and you don't, and, and the solution to those turns out to be, the solution to these NP hard problems, if you can, if you can formulate them correctly, turns out to be things like genetic algorithms and taboo searches. And what what they do is that they actually break the problem up so that you have a distributed problem solution and each little bit tries to do what's best for it mm -hmm. and then then they talk to each other and then they work out which one which one should do his little bit so it's a collaborative yeah. process absolutely yes collaborative but, process. but using uh, i suppose machines to yeah. do a lot of the collaborating the, the machines collaborate mm -hmm. the algorithms collaborate effectively that's what happened then i did a lot of work on search and the collaboration there was um, was effectively how you could get the machine to help you. Uh, and it was I, I did my PhD on this thing, which was essentially searching by browsing, mm -hmm. which was how can you, what can you do to to help people browse through this very large space of things, and effectively, um, uh, it's. It ended up being very similar to um, to the, the same sorts of ideas that are in modern search engines. Mm -hmm. Effectively, you, you you treat your so anyway. So 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 that that then became the idea for for how you could actually improve systems and how we could actually solve some of these problems where we have a lot of command and control because. Computer systems yes. and administrative systems are command and control, and that's not the right way to do it. They don't scale. It doesn't. You can only control a certain number of things, and it doesn't model the real world, where, where you can influence, but Correct. really you don't have that control. Absolutely. So, so you, you can't. You can't. They have to fail. They cannot. They cannot succeed. The pro The reason why they succeed or they stay around for so long is that the people who get the control also get uh, extract rent from the system mm -hmm. once you've got once you've got control you can now get yourself into a rent situation where yes. you can extract rent so the problem is of getting of changing the system is how the hell can you get 
how, how can you get it so that you can distribute the stuff and, and distribute the value as well? And that's where the problems in terms of actually getting things done arises. Well, that's, that's virtually the whole social organisation problem itself. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, so that's, a, that's a very big problem to look at through Welcome. <laughs> So, so where does, where does Welcome fit in, and, okay. and, and how did you actually okay. get to that point where you said, right, this is I'm going to do this? Uh, yeah, it, it, we, our first, our first, um, uh, the first big one that we tried to do um, was a, a micropayments problem, mm -hmm. and the micropayments problem we didn't solve it because we couldn't, well, for various reasons. But the principal one was we couldn't actually get into the market. Mm -hmm. because the rules and regulations around banking were such that we were only allowed to hold on deposit at, at that time about a million dollars. Yep. Now, if you're going to get into micropayments, you have to hold more money than that. Mm -hmm. Now, this was, it's changed since then and people have realised that it's actually not the holding of money that's got to be regulated, it's the, it's the creation of money that's got to be regulated. Yes. So, we weren't creating loans or anything. We we just had fixed money, but but still, we weren't able to do it. But mm -hmm. as part of that thing, I, I realised that the real issue here was identity, because whenever you try and do these things, the main thing that you have to worry about is who you're sending money to. So identity was the next problem. And then I thought, well, okay, what we really should do on the identity stuff is figure out a way in which individuals can take control of their own identity rather than thinking of identity as, as some something over here as being an identity provider. Yeah, something that's controlled by a third yeah. party, yeah. identity is controlled by you. Yeah, you, you, you're the only one yes. <laughs> who knows who you are. So how the hell can someone else do it? Mm -hmm. So the whole identity scene is is wrong, the wrong way around, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's what Welcomer is about. Welcomer is about finding a way of being able to do that. Now, we succeeded in doing that with Identity, which was our, our company, which got sold off. Mm -hmm. to, and, but Identity became successful, um, but it um, it had a good business, it still got a good business. How long ago was that that you sold it? About three years ago. Yep. Um, so I, 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 I tried to, I tried within Identity to to go the next step. The identity was just verification of identity. Mm -hmm. And the end, we figured out ways, um, by screen scraping, um, of people being able to identify themselves yep. and prove that they were who they said they were, rather than an identity provider giving them an identity. Yeah, a sort of digital certificate or some sort of yeah. validation, yeah, yeah, know, something than, physical yeah. or virtual that, yeah, yeah. that says this is you. Yeah. Rather than rather than being an identity provider that gave you an identity that you could then use, you went and proved who you were. Mm -hmm. But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than just verification of identity. It's it's identity itself that's really what we have to distribute. So and, and so it took a, we experimented quite a bit on how to do this and figure out how to do it. And a lot of our time has been spent in the last three years trying to work out how to do it. And and I, and I also didn't really have a good theory that, that fit me. I mean, it's obvious that that's what you've got to do, but there is no real theory. And I've only just recently discovered a theory that I think explains all this mm -hmm. and really helps. And that's the thing called promise theory, where where you, you when you when you have a single identity or a single sign-on or a or a centralized thing of any sort at all, it doesn't matter whether it's identity, any anything at all. When you have a centralized thing, you can't. It, it can only grow to a certain size before it before it becomes internally too complicated. Um, so what you have to do, and the the analogy that they make, if I got time for an analogy, yeah, yeah the, sure. the analogy that the that the guy makes in promise theory is that. He says, we've got this structure, hydrogen and oxygen, and if you put it together in a particular way, you get H2O, and that becomes water. And so you've got, now you've got, you've got lots of H2O molecules that are very tightly bound together. But if you want to get a bigger mass of, H, of hydrogen and oxygen molecules all together, what you do is you 
is you combine, you find a way of combining together the the molecules of H2O. You don't make H20O10 no. or, or whatever else it might be. You don't. You don't, you don't make it a single molecule, no. single large molecule. No. You connect all the molecules. You connect all the identities together. Like Lego blocks. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what we're doing now mm -hmm. with Welcome Right. Okay. We we say, well, we've got lots of identities out there. They're everywhere. Right. You, you've got a, you've got several thousand. I would imagine. God to say that. I mean, you add well, up the every, number. Every you, every social network, every organisation yeah. you deal with. Um, you know, your identity to your yes to your families to your friends to your workplace and so on Everything each is one is is a slightly separate identity but they all attribute back to the same unique individual yes yes but, yeah. but you can't make all those identities trying to make all those identities one identity doesn't work mm. because they're not the same because you want to be different things to different people yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and not only that now with the internet of things <coughs> to different things Yes, yes. <laughs> so, so we now have an identity to this camera. Mm. Right? We are connected to that camera. The camera knows about us, right? Yes. So, so, so we've got a relationship now with the camera. So you've got to have a system that can handle that. And the, and the, and the best way to do it, I believe, and what, this is what we're doing, is, is, is that you've got to figure out a way in which you can take all these independent identities and have a way in which you can connect them when you need to connect them for a particular purpose. Yep. That's what we're doing. Okay. And, uh, yeah, because because that was a major challenge that organizations like Facebook and Google had yeah. where they forced people to use like for example, uh, use two they had to have at least two names. So people with a single name, mono name, were not able to use those services using their actual real legal name. Mm -hmm. And they had those yeah. issues because they tried to yeah. establish a centralised single identity for individuals, and individuals don't have that. No, yeah, no, absolutely. And 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 now we've figured that out how to do it. Um, we're now putting up little proposals to people, and for one just yesterday that's just come up that is really quite quite. A, I think it's going to be really good because it. Because the, 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 the same process, it doesn't matter what the thing is that's being identified, mm. right? It, it doesn't have to be a person. Yeah. Right? It, it, the same process can work for, for a business or for a, a thing. A vehicle or a yeah. building or a, whatever it happens to be. Anything. Yeah, light bulb. Yeah, that's right. They have relationships. Now, when you have a relationship, um, so you have a relationship with, uh, I have a relationship with you, and, and we might have a relationship with some fictitious person that might be down there. Um, now, we, we, the, our relationship, you know me by particular characteristics. Yes. So you know me by my name, mm. right? Um, and the person down there knows me by my mm. name. So I have a name that enables me to be known to the two things. Now, I don't have to be known. That, so what we can do is we can link the fact that I have a name to there is a there is a um, so we've got these two d different identities over here. We can link the name. The fact that I've got a name is the, what you link, not the name itself, but the fact that I have a name can be linked. Right. Okay. So now the mechanism is how the hell can you now make that? Impractical. Well, mm -hmm. you can't actually. So, really, what you're doing is you're connecting the same type of data item in some way between two other entities, mm -hmm. and you do that. Yeah, I, I do that. Right. You, 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 oh, sorry, I do that. Welcome that does that. Or, I, actually, I'm now calling the thing identic. Um, okay. Um, because what's being connected is identical things. Mm -hmm. Not and the identical things are the things. So I have an ID here and I have an ID there. So the fact that I've got an ID is connected. Yes, even um, though the IDs themselves are different. Quite different. Yes. Yeah. So, but you can't actually connect data that's in operational systems because operational systems do not want extraneous things coming along. And, and hitting them. No, right? no, they don't want the, the, they don't want data moving in and out, except under very controlled. Absolutely, and they want to retain control. So yes. what's 
So the mechanism that we've now come up with is that they say these are the bits of data that I'm willing for the, to share or to link to other the same sort of data elsewhere and I'll make a copy of the data mm -hmm. and I'll put it out here still under my control mm -hmm. um, and then and then I will allow not the data to be moved but applications the same application to be uh, an application to be able to access the data mm -hmm. so permissioning is not on data permissioning is on the application if you use an application you are giving implicit permission to access the data. Okay, so that now changes everything. <laughs> well, you're very much looking at like, like if you look at it in, in terms of the network system, you know, mm. we're all nodes on the network. Mm. You're interested in the connections, and you Absolutely. build up the picture of an individual through the connection. Absolutely. So it's almost like those um, like those Facebook maps they make of the world, yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's yeah. you can actually see all the continents outlined by the connections between individuals. Yes, oh, okay, um, I didn't see that one. Yeah, yeah, well, it, very much about, you know, being yeah. able to identify uh, people through right. the connections. Yeah. Um, look, I think that's a really good explanation of mm. how Welcomer works and mm. what you're doing with the system. What has that meant for you as a founder? Like, what sort of journey have you oh, been okay. on through the company? Uh, well, it's really difficult when you, when you, th this actually changes there are several problems associated with, um, I mean, the problem is to get other people to be, you can't do anything on your own. No. And you've got to get customers. The problem is to convince people that it's worthwhile taking a risk. Not, not they don't have to take a risk on their money necessarily, mm -hmm. but they've got to take a risk on attempting, letting me attempt to build something for them. And connect systems together. And, and connect systems together. Yeah. That has been a challenge. Has been and and when you when you do have something that that is really radical, and this is radical because it's going away from the model of centralisation, um, and centralisation in big organisations is 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 critical. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what organisations are about. Is, and so so trying to do something that upsets and people can see it's going to upset. Right? Yes. And, and the power structures and the value is in the current model that they have. Yes. So attempting to do something the opposite way around is actually very difficult. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the old disruptive model. It's, it's like Uber for the taxi industry and mm -hmm. things like that. But mm -hmm. they're able to set up and exist independent of the taxi industry yeah. and then work their way into the market. Whereas you need to, yeah. you know, it, it's, so, it's whether you can build an, your own identity system yeah, and so, then get organisations yeah, involved. So, so I thought I thought the way to do it would be to would be to do an example system. Mm -hmm. uh, so I built a thing called Welcome Aboard, which had all the things, and and it works and it does things. But I wasn't able to sell it because I have to go and sell into these different things, and I and and it turns out you can't. In the way in which I was doing it, um, I, I'd attempted to go down the bottom, and I thought small business would be the ones to do it. But small business won't, they, they're more risk averse than big business. So they, and that's saying something. And, and um, so, it, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't possible to do it. Well, I didn't find it possible to do it. Um, but I might have another way of another okay. application. That, so welcome and board, I wasn't able to do it. Um, but it gave the idea and was it, it shows so it's a proof of concept in a way so now so now what i'm doing is I, i'm now going out to to with with more with okay the the underlying network in my opinion has to remain in public hands yes and the way for that to happen is for it to be open source software mm -hmm. um, so the under but the applications that are built on top of that can be uh, can be owned by someone. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm going to owners of applications or want to be builders of applications and saying here's an application and if you do it this way it'll be it'll be much more efficient and you will be able to do it. And so I'm now working with. Um, um, some large organisations 
and I'm also working with some small organisations to to try and with, with different ones. And one of them will mm. one of them will happen. Yeah, because you, because you sort of have the fax machine or the internet problem. You know, yes. you need yes. actually yes. someone on each end, <laughs> yes. or the system is useless. So you need yes. at least two parties yes. and and Absolutely. preferably multiple parties yes. involved. Absolutely, that's what yeah. you, that's what you're going to have. So, yeah, so that's a really big challenge, particularly in, in this country, to get out there and because there's relatively small, large or medium yeah, sized organisations. Yeah, I, I, it's. Um, uh, I'm actually, I think, doing. It, I'm gradually getting there, mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult in the mm -hmm. sense that it's challenging, shall we say, mm. is, is a better word. But it's all right because I know, I know that the, 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 it doesn't take very much to figure out. This is so much cheaper. This, this is this. You know. I, I believe it's at least an order of magnitude cheaper to do the same problem. Mm -hmm. If you've got an application and you can do it with using a distributed model as opposed to a centralised model, for large systems it will be at least an order of magnitude. And the, and the centralised system won't work anyway. Yes. Right? Well, it works to a degree. It, it works 90% of the time. It yeah, works, it works. But it's very inflexible. It can't change very much. You have a distributed system. Each of the little nodes out here can be can be um, modifying itself, and, and and then the best ones of those can be easily spread throughout the network. Mm -hmm. So the the model is to keep everything distributed, and and have these connections of the same data. That gets rid of. Let's get rid of the if. That makes again this part of the permissioning problem, and getting rid of permissioning in personal data is is probably the root that we can get in. Because once you get rid of the need to get permissions, mm -hmm. then it makes it easy, for example, for government to connect data in the tax office with the data in the social security, because because it's it's you're not transferring data from here to here what you're doing is the person says i've got the same data here and i've got the same data here you're connecting it together yeah, that's and, and that solves you know one of one of the biggest issues for large organizations is simply updating somebody's address information yeah. when they move or change their yeah. phone number or something like yeah. that and this and that's one of the applications yeah. that i've yeah I've got and, and that's one of the simpler ones yeah. and, and you solve that and already that's uh, saves a lot of money and and, 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 and the nice thing about it is that once I get one, <laughs> once you have one of these systems in place, then everything else it grows. It, it's the same. It's the same problem, mm -hmm. and it's and again, as I say, it's the same problem for the Internet of Things. Now there have been two other in my, in my searching around for trying to find explanations of what I'm doing. There have been two other really important papers from IBM. Uh, these two are. One of them is a uh, is a thing on um, Keystone Technologies, um, and and the best and so that's that's so look up Keystone Technologies and mm -hmm. see what they do, and we think that Identic is a Keystone Technology mm -hmm. that, that that exists, and then other things are built on top. Yeah, it's it's one of the fundamental right. Right. infrastructure tools you need to build a distributed right. system. That's right. Yeah, and the other one is a. Is an article um, on people who have been trying to work out how to do the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. and these guys have come up and they're doing something with Samsung about building the Internet of Things stuff, and they have come to the conclusion that you have you cannot do it as a centralised thing, you have to do it so that they have autonomy autonomy out there, and you have to work out ways in which those things can work. So it's a scaling issue. Again, it's a scaling, yeah. it's a scaling problem. It, it's obviously not going to work. Mm -hmm. Centralization is not going to work for the Internet of Things. It's yeah, it, yeah like it, it doesn't even work for human societies. You know, like no. it's, it's been tried and has failed you know, dismally in yeah. the past. So with all of that, you know, what, oh, sorry, the other yeah. thing, the other thing about it is that the tragedy of the commons is is what I sort of is the other problem is. The way in which we have solved, or in the past have solved, the the allocation of common resources is to privatise it. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's not a good idea because privatisation and ownership, and by by privatisation I mean ownership. Ownership implies renting. Mm -hmm. 
ownership implies that you can rent the site. Rent doesn't add any extra value. No, no, it's 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 actually a, a cost. It's a cost, and it's and it doesn't and the and the rent. So things things that rent seekers, oh, and that's most business. <laughs> certainly, it's most big business is is a real problem. Mm -hmm. But if you have a distributed thing, you you don't you can you can distribute the value as well. It does and the same thing applies and in particular to money. Mm. So what we do now and why we're in such deep dire straits is that we rent money, right? And people own the money. Well no, you shouldn't do that. You can rent you can rent an object or you can rent a thing and use it but money itself is just is is not it's, something it's a medium of exchange it's so a medium of yeah. exchange yeah it, it it's it's they think of it as being a store of value but if it's a mm -hmm. store of value it shouldn't increase <laughs> right yes uh, so if it's using it as a store of value why should it increase mm. yeah like, that, 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 the, like the things may increase the in value which you measure in money but the money itself increasing the money supply as every bank does, and the government has a lot of control over, yeah, doesn't doesn't quite fit. Yeah. So, so the, when you create, so the government, the, the, and there's a big movement now on what they call spending money into existence, and that's what we used to do, right? We used to do that. That's what the Commonwealth Bank did mm -hmm. way back in when it first first started. That's how they paid for the First World War. That's essentially how they got out of the. Big depression. Yes, they they started up a war and spent money. That's what they did, right? Mm. <laughs> and that's how that's how that's how China got where it's, it's got to. They spent money. They spent money into existence. Right now, okay, you make some mistakes as to what you what you spend the money on, but if you spend it on infrastructure and if you spend it on social goods and so forth, then it's much more likely to so. So that my next project, after I've got work, <laughs> done, yep. is to uh, is to apply the idea to money. Wow, that's a big one. Particularly when you've got things like um, you know Bitcoin and, and the the idea of the the uh, chains of value starting to come through and starting to be adopted at large scale too. But they, that's they a really interesting. But they don't they don't solve the problem because they no. It's it's, a, it's it just reframes the problem. Yeah, it's it's actually it's not a it's. It's, they're solving a different problem. Mm. That's not. That's, uh, yeah. Anyway. So, so when you talked about you know retiring from academia, you haven't retired. What no, you've no. done is you've you've done a career change. So you've stepped yeah, fully yeah. into the, into the startup space. And yeah. You've no. Already done identity, and uh, you did a few things before that, and now it's mm. welcomer, mm. and you already have what's planned next. Mm. So, so when will you know when welcomer has been successful or? Has is it just you have to move on? As soon as I can, as soon as I can get someone to take it over, as soon as it's in a state in which someone else wants to do it, mm -hmm. take it over, um, then then I'm then I'm finished. Okay. So, and I'm looking. Mm. Right? I'm looking for someone. <laughs> so if you know someone who wants to, <laughs> who wants to take it over, um, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's I think it's now getting to the stage at which. I've got to get a, one or two of these applications out there first. Mm -hmm. Once that's done, then I'm, I'm out of it.